Damn it. Uh, <laughs> my slides are not working again. Why not? Hi everyone, just uh, dealing with some technical details, right? Uh, difficulties right now. Okay, can folks see slides? Hopefully Twitch can see. Okay, I'm two minutes late, so let's go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, uh, welcome back after I hope what was a restful um, uh, long weekend. So today uh, we're gonna dive into um, sort of the culmination, I would say, of the Haskell lectures. In particular, we're gonna talk about types and type inference inside Haskell. Um, this will be spread over two lectures and I have other topics to splash into if we end early. So we're probably not gonna get through all these slides, but hopefully we'll get through most of them and then more about it. Uh, one logistical thing, uh, midterms are coming up. So what's gonna happen is, uh, so the type checker lab is out. After the type checker lab um, is due, I am going to publish some practice exams from previous years to give you a sense for what the midterm is going to look like. And then the midterm is just going to be a take home, uh, uh, you know, take home exam that you'll have uh, uh, a set amount of time to do. So um, yeah, so let's get started on this lecture. Okay, so there are two parts to this lecture. So one is um, I want to talk a little bit more about what are types. Um, we've sort of glossed over it. I've said things like, well, you know, in Haskell, everything is strongly typed. We've talked a little bit about polymorphism. Uh, I just want to dig deeper into this topic. And the second part of this lecture, uh, we'll talk about Hanley Milner type inference, which is the underlying basis for type inference in Haskell. It basically says, um, how uh, you know Haskell type checker actually figures out whether or not your program is well typed or not. And uh, if it's not, it gives you an error in that case. Um, so after we're done with this lecture, uh, you'll understand how the type checker works. And then in the lab, you will go and implement a type checker yourself. All right, so let's get started. What is a type? So, um, at a superficial level, uh, you know, types are these things we use to describe various values in Haskell. So, for example, if I write the value true in Haskell, I say that its type is Boolean. And um, if we don't think too hard, you know, that's kind of like what, what a type is, right? And so, in general, we, we write lots of expressions that represent programs in Haskell, and each of these has some type. And, you know, there are a number of different possible types you can have that we've looked over, right? We've looked at the types of basic primitive uh, data types in Haskell, like integers and booleans and strings. And we've also looked at more complicated types, such as the types of functions, like functions from integers to booleans, and um, you know even more exotic types, like higher order functions that take in functions as arguments and produce more functions. So hopefully with all of the Haskell code you've been writing, you probably have some sort of working understanding about what it means to be a type, at least in Haskell. And so um, if I were defining a compiler, and indeed this is something we're gonna to have to do when we work on the lab, um, we could define a type 
as its own inductive data structure. Um, here I've just used BNF syntax, but you could also easily write a algebraic data type re representing a type. And what would you put in this algebraic data type? Well, you'd say, you know, we have various primitive types like integers and booleans. We have the types of functions where, you know, what is a function type? Well, it's a recursively constructed type that takes in some type as the input argument type and then some type as the output argument type. And that can be anything you want. It can be integers, it can be booleans, it can be other functions, right? If T1 is a function, you have a higher order function. If T2 is a function, well, that's just how multi-argument functions in Haskell work. So that's, that's you know, the working knowledge of types in Haskell. But I wanna ask in this first part of the lecture, what is a type really? Like, what's the point of types? You know, what do they actually mean? Um, why do they exist at all? So there are a number of sort of explanations we can give um, for uh, what a type is in these situations. So one uh, explanation for like why types exist is that they are a way to prevent errors. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, you know, let's take a look at this program where I try to print out 100 added to the string Bob. This is a kind of strange thing to do. Probably I messed up when I was writing this program. And if I have types, and in particular, if I have types that are checkable by the compiler, the compiler can tell me that something has gone wrong and hey, uh, your program probably doesn't look quite right and you should you know, do something else with it. This is sort of a very superficial way of um, using types, right? Like if types were just a way to prevent errors, honestly, that's not that compelling. But for some reason, whenever people you know, say, oh, what are, what are static types good for? They often say, oh, it's for preventing errors. And oh, it's true, but you know, there's, there's more to types than just that. Um, one thing that I'll add though is that um, Preventing errors is pretty handy when your types get kind of complicated. So we've looked at a bunch of higher order functions. Here, for example, is a higher order function that takes in some function, takes in a value, and applies that function to that value. Ooh, like, you know, kind of meta. And if you have a type system that can tell you, you know, hey, well, the argument type of this function has to be the same as the value that you pass in here. And if it's not, well, like, you know, there's something naughty going on. This still isn't that complicated, but you could imagine that if you've got some complicated, you know, higher order function with lots and lots of, you know, uh, inner functions, it would be pretty helpful to have someone to tell you if you've lined everything up correctly or not. In fact, you don't even need uh, higher order functions to get into situations where it's helpful to have a type checker looking over your shoulder and telling you if you've done something wrong or not. Just imagine if you have a function and it takes three Boolean arguments and well, which one is which? Uh, well, if they're just Booleans, you can't really tell and you could mix up the ordering. But if they were, for example, uh, different types, denoting different things for those situations, then you would get a type error if you accidentally try to pass in, you know, is hot uh, into the um, flag that was actually representing is red. So, so yeah, so I think only looking at types as a way to prevent errors sort of is, um, is underselling the meaning of types quite a bit, but it is important to note that types are really good at this. Right, um, they basically guarantee a way when you have a statically typed programming language or even a dynamically typed programming language, although the guarantee in that case is different. When you have a typed programming language, uh, you guarantee that certain classes of errors are not possible because your compiler will tell you if you made that error. So um, uh, there's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of ways to get guarantees in computer science, right? Like if you write a program and you think to yourself, hmm, how do I check if this program is correct or not? Well, you can run some tests on it, but that's not a guarantee, right? You, there could be some test case that you hadn't thought of that breaks your program. But type systems, they give a guarantee. No matter what, the errors that your type system is able to catch 
will be caught. And we call methods for getting guarantees like this formal methods. And type systems are arguably the world's most popular lightweight formal method. They're really popular because lots of programming languages are statically typed. And they're really lightweight because you don't have to like, you know, get a PhD in uh, uh, theorem proving to figure out how to use them. You know, most people pick them up and it kind of makes sense how to make use at least of like integers and booleans. Higher order functions, okay, maybe that's a little more big brain, but um, the basic stuff, you know, it's not that hard to pick up. So what I think is a more compelling reason for types is um, that they are a method of program organization. Um, I've alluded to this in earlier lectures, you know, in particular in the Haskell intro lecture, I said types will change the way you think about programs. And why is that the case? Well, um, there was a little blurb at the bottom of my earlier slide that's types are specifications, right? So when you're writing types down, when you're like writing your programs and you have a bunch of type signatures available describing what it is that you need to write, just like in the labs where most of the time I've given you type signatures already and you're just sort of filling in functions that have those types. These, uh, these types tell you what your program is supposed to do at a very coarse grain level and that helps you understand how you should go about writing your program. Now there's also lots of ways you can use types in interesting ways to get more info about your program than you know would normally come out. For example, um, uh, mixing up units of measurement is a very uh, you know classic uh, uh, mistake that you know formal methods researchers love putting on their slides when they're giving you know grant application talks because like you know someone mixed up meters with feet and then your rocket ship crashed into um, crashed into uh, Mars instead of uh, you know actually landing safely. And um, you know, if I have two quantities like two degrees Fahrenheit and two degrees Celsius, well, these are very different quantities. But um, if I'm just looking at uh, things from uh, the perspective of integers, I can't tell the difference. But types um, can help us make these distinctions. They can help us uh, you know, distinguish between things that maybe are representationally equivalent, you know, at the end of the day, you only need an integer to store your temperature, whether it's degrees or Fahrenheit, but not semantically equivalent um, because, you know, two degrees Fahrenheit is different from two degrees Celsius. Um, when we talk about types of specifications, they also are a really good way of eliminating a lot of the documentation you have to write. Um, in untyped languages. So for example, um, we have this function plus, okay, these are very simple examples. Um, it takes two integers and it returns their sum. If we look at this comment that I've written above here and we look at the type signature in question, the comment actually like isn't adding all that much more information that the type gives because the type tells us what the arguments are, what the return type is, and how many arguments I need to pass. And really all I need to know is, you know, what is the operation that I'm actually doing, aka sum. But you could probably figure that out just by reading the name of the function in question. So uh, in my day job, I write Python all the time and I write all these functions and then I have to write doc blocks for them. And the very first thing I do is I write a bunch of type signatures because it's very useful for people to know what types um, my functions are expected to uh, take in. And, you know, like whether or not your compiler is helping you do this or not, um, the types are a really useful way of describing, you know, what your program's uh, invariants are. And uh, all the better if your compiler can enforce this for you because then you don't have to, you know, uh, worry about getting it wrong or having your documentation be out of date. It's always guaranteed to be up to date. Um, so like heading back to that apply example here, right in Haskell, this type signature is basically tight. It tells you everything you needed to know about this function. In fact, there are no other implementations of this type signature given a function A to B, give me an A to B, than apply is here. So like literally this comment is completely unnecessary. You can figure it all out from the type signature. Um, 
We also took a look at some of the data structures in Haskell. And um, once again, uh, I don't necessarily need to show you the documentation for these data structures. I can just give you the type signatures for a number of functions in. Like, let's look at sets, right? Um, sets have a number of functions. There's an empty function, an insert function, a delete function, and a member function. And with both the name of the function and the type in question, you basically know everything you need to know about how to use this data structure. Like if I want to delete something from a set, well, I'm going to use the delete function. Which argument should I pass first? Well, I see in the type signature that it takes a K and then a set K. So, well, I guess I should give the key first and then the set. And uh, what does it return? Well, it returns a new set, right? Which is the set with the key deleted from it. Um, if you uh, did some of the homeworks by looking their, up the documentations uh, on Haddock, uh, on Hackage, basically there's these module documentations. Of course, there are, you know, there's plain English descriptions of all the functions, but if you go on the right side of your screen, there's a little, um, there's a little, there's a little sidebar, which basically just gives you all the functions and their type signatures. And sometimes that's enough. And remember um, Hoogle, right, the, the Haskell type search engine, that's just saying, hey, well, if you give me a type, I probably can find the function that you're looking for. So, you know, types, types are pretty good. They tell you a lot about what your programs do. Uh, so, so we talked about types for getting rid of errors and we talked about types for sort of explaining what your programs do and giving meaning to them. Um, and I would be miss if I didn't say that there's another reason for doing types, and that is to give a hint to your compiler. So for example, um, let's imagine we're writing some JavaScript and uh, I'm writing something as innocuous as um, x equals um, you know, the key entry on some record. And so in JavaScript, uh, without any of the fancy just-in-time compilation, um, what this operation has to actually do is I have to take my key, uh, my string key, I need to turn it into some hash code, I need to look it up on some hash table on the record, and then I need to finally uh, you know, get the value out from that entry in the record. And this is pretty cheap. Hash tables are kind of magic. They're O1 data structures, they're very fast. But if you keep doing this over and over again, the costs add up. And um, we can't really do any better if we don't know anything about the record, because we don't even know what keys might be on the record uh, in the absence of any information. But if we have types, then we know more things. We might know what the type of the record is, and by knowing the type of the record, we may know where the actual entry for that key is. And so instead of having to do all of the hash table finagling, we can just say, well, um, I know at compile time, that this is a um, record off object, and I know what the layout of that object is, and so I can just go straight to a uh, specific offset. Um, it's literally just a you know pointer uh, add and then a dereference to get out the entry in question. And yes, this is not this is the same asymptotics. It's still constant time to do this deep memory dereference, but you know add it up in aggregate you can actually get a lot faster than having to repeatedly do these hash table lookups. And you know, if we think about what the crazy just-in-time compilers that are built into your uh, browsers are all about, well, it's specifically for the purpose of um, you know, figuring out what the types of things are and then recompiling your code from these hash table lookups to the fast direct offset lookups. The important thing here um, is that the type has to be available to the compiler, right? We can't um, uh, do something clever in compilation if I don't know what the type of the thing is going to be. So um, satellite type languages tend to you know, be easier to compile because there's more information, more hints to the compiler that tell it how to do these optimizations. If you don't have these hints at compile time, then you have to do something like a tracing JIT where you look at what the arguments are at runtime, and then, and only then, can you actually uh, profitably compile your code in question. 
Uh, there's a question, which is, would such a transformation actually happen in a compiler in a non-JIT context? Uh, so, um, I mean, the, the like short answer is yes. Like if I'm writing C++ and I do a field access, uh, well, okay. So, so there is a, there's a little, um, a caveat, right? So the caveat is that, um, in C++, if I had a record and I wanted to access some key on it, um, I wouldn't actually do it as a hash table, right? I would just define a class and then, um, directly access the field on class. So maybe you were th asking me, well, you know, uh, what if I actually wrote this code in C++, which this code would be valid C++, um, like would the compiler be able to do that? And the answer is no, because like if I have an unordered hash map and I uh, am just looking at the, um, the record in question, uh, I have no idea what the keys on it are. So I can't do the optimization. But let's say that you did know you, you were in some fancy programming language where you had dictionaries, but they had types and the types told you what keys were on them. Then yes, you could. And I, I assert without examples that uh, the compilers for those languages would know how to uh, efficiently compile in those situations. So if you ask Bob Harper, uh, a very renowned PL professor over at CMU, um, what a type is, he'll say the central types are the central organizing principle of the theory of programming languages. So um, uh, if you um, like go to a programming languages academic conference and you look at the papers, um, a decent chunk of them will be about fancy type systems and all sorts of other things. Because like, there's a really interesting, like, uh, what's it called? When we are studying new language features, when we're studying new ways of doing things in programming languages, oftentimes what we will be looking at is how the type system for these things work. Because just you know inventing features randomly that kind of works and if you look for example at the lisp tradition they have all these like fancy gadgets that like do crazy things and people have no idea how to use them um uh because they're very difficult to understand how they go and over time people have sort of rationalized how these like advanced tricks have worked and they've done it by thinking about what the types of things are. Um, the one example that I, I'm particularly thinking about in my head and we'll be able to talk about more in a later lecture is how continuations eventually turned into delimited continuations, which eventually turned into algebraic effects. Um, and this transition, uh, okay, the, these three words don't, these three terms don't mean anything, but the transition I would say um, was basically people added more structure to these uh, th these constructs, and how do they add the more structure? Well, part of it was looking more carefully at the types in question. We will we will talk about continuations in a later lecture. Do not worry; um, it'll be lots of fun. Okay, so um, I want to sort of uh, make a gear shift and talk a little bit about type errors for a moment. Um, and in particular, I've been using the term uh, dynamically and statically typed um, and strongly and weakly typed uh, sort of casually. And I just want to define them if you're not familiar with them and uh, talk a little bit about it. So what is a type error? Well, a type error is, um, is uh, you know, any situation where your type system says, no, 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 this pro pro program is wrong. But uh, whether or not a type system is going to tell you a program is wrong or not depends on the language in question, right? We've already seen how Haskell has a very advanced type system. It supports a lot of things. And um, in many other type systems, uh, things are a lot simpler. And so you might not be able to write, you know, polymorphic functions or, uh, you know, like a fancy, uh, fancy code using higher order functions, depending on the language in question. And similarly, uh, uh, in this example, um, we have this example of um, indexing into index 200 on a size 10 array. And on um, you know, many languages, uh, 
this is just not something that the type system is able to capture at all. So if you like did this array indexing in C and C++, you just get a seg fault, right? Uh, assuming this is one of those unchecked uh, uh, accessors on the array in question. And in Haskell or even in Java, um, once again, the type system isn't going to help you, but it's not, you're not going to get a seg fault and so you just get some sort of exception saying that you're out of bounds. But if you were in some sort of uh, very fancy, advanced, maybe dependently typed language, which knew what the size of the array was statically, you might actually um, conceivably uh, um, be able to give a compile time error message talking about the error in question. So, so what's going on here? So neither of the type systems in question were able to cache this error, but there was there is still a difference, right? In C and C++, if you go out of bounds, basically arbitrarily bad things can happen. So there's a very weak um, safety in this situation. It's really not helping you at all. Um, in uh, the Haskell Java case, uh, well, you can make the error, the compiler isn't gonna stop you, but if the error does happen, you are guaranteed to get a reasonable looking error message in this case. You're not going to uh, suddenly you know, start playing a game of Pong, which is what could happen if someone is you know, smashing your stack and then uh, letting, making your code go to some arbitrary code execution. Now let's look at a different example. So instead of uh, accessing out of bounds, let's consider a situation where my array pointer is a null pointer. And so once again, in C++ and C++, if I try to uh, index into element 200 on a null pointer, I'll still get a seg fault. And yes, I can still end up playing Pong when I do a situation like this. And in Java, like in the out of bounds case, Java is going to give you a null pointer dereference <coughs> Uh, saying that, hey, you know, you attempted to do reference a null pointer. So uh, it's not going to do arbitrary behavior, but at least you're guaranteed to get a runtime exception in this case. But in Haskell, in Haskell, the type system is strong enough to make the distinction between uh, things that are possibly null and things that are de most definitely not null. <clears throat> so if I want to index into an array, um, I have to actually have an array. And uh, if I have an array, it's guaranteed to be there. Um, it cannot possibly be null. So if I wanna express the concept of something that might be there, but might not be there, well, we've talked about the maybe type in Haskell, which lets us you know, take some type and say, well, maybe I have it, maybe I don't have it. That's um, very similar to the concept of nullability or the concept of optional in some languages. And now if our array is a maybe array because it might possibly be null, and in fact, in this situation, it would have been null if we were running the program, then the type checker is gonna tell us, no, 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 that's not okay. Um, the indexing operator expected an array and you gave it a maybe array and these types don't line up, so you gotta do something. And then you'll do something like, maybe you'll case over the array, checking if it is null or not null, or maybe you'll like, you know, use a naughty function that converts this type error into a runtime error because you, you're thinking to yourself, well, I know that it's never gonna be null. Um, although maybe you should have refactored your program so that it wasn't a maybe array in that case. So what you can see, right, is that depending on the language, how bad, the error is and when you find out about the error can differ. And so this, um, uh, this leads us to the first set of um, you know, nomenclature that I'm now going to properly define, which is um, the distinction between compile time and runtime type safety. So if type safety is this glorious glittering um, city in the distance, there are two ways we can get there. One way we can get there is by um, asking the compiler to work with us. So we can say, well, I want a fancy type system that the compiler knows how to check. And um, the compiler will go ahead and look at my program and try to figure out if I make a type error. And if I do, then um, you know the compiler will tell me that there's a problem. This is pretty cool, it helps us find errors very quickly, but there is also a concept of runtime type safety. 
And then in the concept of runtime type safety, I'm not trying to say, well, um, I need to figure out everything at compile time, but I am trying to give a little more safety than you know, seg faulting and starting to play a game of Pong. I'd want to guarantee, for example, that if there is a type mismatch, then um, uh, I will raise an error instead of you know, arbitrarily eating your lunch. So these are both forms of type safety, right? It's just that one of them happens at compile time with a static type system, and another one happens at runtime with a dynamic type system. So um, Haskell and Java, these are languages with static type systems, so um, a lot of them are done at compile time, whereas lots of popular languages like JavaScript and Lisp, they don't have a type checker, but they still have a notion of types because every uh, every value in the language does have a type. And if you try to do something with an object that then you know the types don't line up, uh, you will properly get an error in that situation. Uh, any any questions about um, this distinction for type safety? Another quip that Bob Harper likes to make is that uh, dynamically typed languages, it's not that they aren't statically typed, but there's only one type in these languages. They are unityped systems, um, which uh, I guess is um, a interesting thing to say. But uh, most of the time, people are thinking about um, you know when the type checking actually happens. Is it at compile time or at runtime? Uh, there is a question, which is, would something like MyPy for Python fit along with Racket under gradual types? So let me first explain what gradual types are. So gradual types are a very interesting line of research, um, which basically says, hey, um, lots of people really like writing in dynamically typed languages. Um, is there a way we can gradually add types to your language to... Uh, uh, basically ease the transition because once you have a large code base and it's all dynamically typed, uh, trying to make it statically typed can be a lot of work. And so if you can just uh, add small amounts of static types here and there and eventually get to full type safety, that would be an easy way to um, get from the runtime universe to the compile time universe. So um, MyPy is a type checker for Python. Yes, I said Python is dynamically typed, but it does have a type checker. And um, in many ways, it is very similar to uh, racket style gradual types because in MyPy, you don't have to you don't have to uh, type annotate everything. There are a lot of um, provisions for you know being able to annotate some parts of your Python program, but not all parts. So something that's very common is people will write type annotations on their functions, but then they won't, they won't bother like making sure the insides of the functions type check. So the types are like a form of documentation that uh, the uh, MyPy type checker knows about. Now, there is a difference that I would say, which is that um, the racket line of research on gradual types is all about um, still getting guarantees. And what do I mean by guarantees? Well, when I have a fully fledged compile time type system, when something is type checked, I'm guaranteed that I'm not going to get any type errors. And so the sort of research question in gradual types is if I only type check part of my program, what guarantees can I actually get um, with regards to things being well typed or not? And there's some, um, you can actually get pretty far there where uh, for example, there's this concept of blame in gradual typing, where basically if a dynamic runtime type error happens, um, who can you blame? And well-typed code is never to blame when there is a runtime type error. MyPy is consi uh, considerably more, um, what, what would I say? Um, uh, I guess the nice way to put it is pragmatic. Uh, it doesn't really look to give any guarantees. It's just there to sort of help you find errors. Um, uh, but if you were, say, writing compiler, you wouldn't really be able to use uh, MyPy types without a lot of, um, you know, like battening down the hatches to like guarantee that things were one thing or another. But yes, they are gradual in the sense that you don't have to add them all at once to your program. Okay, um, so another thing that I want to talk about um, when we're thinking about uh, uh, type systems. Um, oh, there's another question. So the other question is, is MyPy similar to TypeScript? 
Um, so I'm not familiar enough with TypeScript to say. For those of you who don't know what TypeScript is, TypeScript is a dialect of JavaScript, but with extra types added to it. But I don't know how they went about doing it. But yeah, I, I guessing from the characteristics of JavaScript, which is also an extremely dynamic language, I'm guessing TypeScript was designed in a way that was similar to MyPy. Okay, so we have a, a trade-off. Uh, so I want to talk about the other axis. So we just talked about runtime versus compile time, but there's another axis which is strong versus weak. And here, um, the question that I'm asking is, um, you know, basically, how much should your types express? And there's a trade-off um, which is between expressivity versus information. So here is a um, here is a function that is very hard to type check in um, most programming languages. So this is a function that takes a, uh, a single argument and it tests if the argument is less than 10. If it is, it returns x. Otherwise, it calls x. Calls x. So, so somehow x is like um, different types depending on if it's less than 10 or not. And um, we wouldn't be able to type check this in Haskell. Haskell would just say, no, 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 that's an error. But sometimes there are programs that you want to write that like are just hard to express in your type system. And while this rarely happens in Haskell, because Haskell has a very nice type system, although it does, for example, Haskell doesn't have subtyping. So if you wanted to write object-oriented programs in Haskell, you'd have a pretty hard time. But in many other languages, sometimes you know you just can't write down the types you want for the function you want. And so uh, it, your types right, aren't, aren't trying to completely replicate the program, because if they did, there'd be no point in types. There, you would just you know, write programs all by themselves. The types are trying to sort of express some subset of the information about your program in question. But sometimes you need more than um, you know, what's traditionally available to actually express what your programs are supposed to do. And um, this term that I've used before, dependent types, what's so dependent about them? Well, these are types which can make reference to values in your program. And uh, these are dependent types are pretty complicated to use in practice, but they also give you a lot of power. And so when you're like thinking about your type system and you're like, you know, how many features do I want to put into it? How expressive do I want my type system to be? Um, you have to think about like, you know, uh, the trade-offs between usability uh, versus expressivity in this situation. Uh, okay, so um, let's um, let's step back for a moment and. Um, uh, talk about like you know what kinds of um, uh, type systems are all out there, and um, um, I'll talk about this as sort of being the strength of the type system. And so we have um, we have languages that I would say are safe, and so this this is orthogonal from the problem of whether or not something is uh, statically typed or dynamically typed. Instead, um, the question is whether or not um, you know, the programs are guaranteed to have defined semantics or if they can do arbitrarily bad things if your type uh, are not enforced. And so um, languages that are in the safe category include Haskell, NML, and Java, but they also include JavaScript and Lisp. JavaScript and Lisp are safe, right? You might get a runtime error, but you're, you are going to get a runtime error. You're going to get a proper error from your language if you mix up your types. JavaScript had better be safe because you, when you browse the internet, you are doing all sorts of different, um, different things, uh, running all sorts of code from random websites that you may not necessarily trust. So if JavaScript wasn't safe, um, you would probably be a very sad camper. Um, there's a question in chat, which is, what do I mean by safe? And um, uh, so, so intuitively, what I mean by safe is whether or not you can write programs in this language and then, um, and then expect them to behave predictably. Um, what do I mean by predictably? Well, um, I mean, you know, they will actually give you proper results or they'll give you errors, um, when you do something that's incorrect. 
And so we can contrast this, these with unsafe languages like C and C++, where um, uh, if I write a program in C++ and you know it's just a random program, I don't know what it is, um, this program could do arbitrarily bad things. It could trigger undefined behavior and undefined behavior basically says, um, yeah, sucks to be you, anything can happen, including uh, you know, firing nuclear missiles or you know, turning your uh, program into a game of Pong. And um, one, one way uh, uh, people often look at this question is as a question of memory safety. So memory safety being whether or not uh, you're guaranteed to uh, always be, it's, it's once again a question of what kinds of errors can happen in your program, right? A memory safe program can never use after free. It can never double free um, some piece of memory because uh, the way the language has been set up, it is guaranteed not to have a problem like that. And when you have a language like C, where you can manually memory manage by, with malloc and free, there's just no way to actually enforce this. Um, there's a question, which is, is typecasting somewhat related to safety in a language? And um, that's a good question. Um, so by typecasting, I assume you mean being able to, like, for example, in JavaScript, if I added a string to a number, the number would get cast into a string. And so like tree plus three would be tree three. Um, and uh, once again, it depends on you know what your concept of safety is, right? If your concept of safety is uh, memory safety, then um, yeah, like casting between strings and integers willy-nilly, that's memory safe. You're not going to get a seg fault uh, doing things that way. But if you're a uh, higher standard of safety, um, maybe it's not so safe. Um, implicit conversions can lead to lots of sort of unexpected behavior, uh, but most of the time when we talk about a language being safe, uh, we're not really making reference to whether or not it typecasts or not. Um, there's another question here, which is, would the behavior of any program uh, is well-defined be a decent definition for safe? And then almost safe could be most programs are well-defined or all programs that don't do X are well-defined. Um, that's a good question. Let me think. Um, so definedness is a tricky question because um, whether or not something is defined or undefined is also a language specific concept. And for example, um, uh, so-called safe languages can have um, instances of non-determinism where if you do something, um, we're not actually gonna give you any, uh, like we're not gonna give you a guarantee about what's gonna happen in the situation. So a, a classic example of this is in Java, you can write multi-threaded programs. And um, when you write multi-threaded programs, there's a possibility for data races. And when a data race happens, well, you know, there is some, like Java isn't gonna guarantee that you're gonna get one result or another when a data race occurs. But there is some, there are some guarantees that Java still gives even in those situations. And in particular, Java guarantees that even if you data race, there is not going to be a seg fault. So, um, so yeah, so whether or not it's about being well-defined or not, that's, that's difficult to say. But certainly undefined behavior in C and C++ is very bad because in those cases, all bets are off. Um, my um, almost safe category here uh, is um, these are all sort of like weird niche languages. And mostly this is because they did have type systems or they did check types, but they couldn't you know, figure out what, the, um, what to do about memory allocations. And you'll notice that up at the top, these are all garbage collected languages because you, know, you don't have to worry about memory safety in a garbage collected language. Uh, so before I, before I hit the other question, just to follow up. So it's more of a subjective thing based off how much behavior is guaranteed to happen or not happen. And, um, I'd say, yes, there, there are no, there are not hard and fast rules about, um, safety and, uh, there it's, it's something that you do have to like define on a per language basis. By the way, there is a very technical definition of safety for type systems. Um, and uh, so if you're like a um, PL theorist, 
and you're devising a type system for a language um, with some runtime semantics, um, the technical definition for something being type safe is that it never gets uh, what we call stuck. So the way this looks is that you have a uh, you have some sort of very complicated uh, state machine slash transition system that describes how your program executes and um, and uh, there are rules for various situations like you know when your program is in this state then this transition happens and um, a well typed program is one that um, will never ever get into a program state where there are just no possible further valid transitions. Uh, and, and then you would say that a language like that is type safe. And um, you can cheat, right? You can cheat by saying, well, in any situation where we would have not had any valid steps, um, let's just step into the error state. And indeed, that is a type safe program and corresponds to the behavior for lots of dynamic languages. Okay, uh, there's another question, which is, um, uh, uh, is Rust unsafe block unsafe here? Um, so yeah, so I don't have Rust here, but if I were putting Rust in the pyramid, Rust goes in the safe, uh, the very top of the pyramid, the safe pyramid. And while, so if you don't know what Rust is, Rust is a very interesting systems programming language. It is not garbage collected, so it's manually memory managed, but they have a very complicated type system slash borrow checking system to basically make sure that you never use memory after it's been freed um, by very carefully taking track of ownership, which by the way, we will have a lecture about later uh, in this class. And so um, Rust uh, has um, this language construct called, un called unsafe, um, which basically lets you ignore the borrow checker and do whatever the heck you want. And this is very important for writing Rust programs because uh, Rust type system is very stringent. And so sometimes you may want to write data structures that sort of do things that Rust type system would not normally allow. And so now to answer the question, yes, Rust unsafe blocks are unsafe. In much the same way, for example, I put Haskell here as a safe language, but actually Haskell has an FFI you can call into arbitrary C code. That FFI is unsafe. And um, you know you can cause Haskell programs to seg fault in that way. Um, Java also has an FFI, and it's also similarly unsafe. You can cause seg faults. And the point of um, so why so so if Haskell I can write a seg fault in Haskell, then why the heck is it in the safe part of the pyramid, right? Like, can I you know write one of these FFI programs and cause my program to seg fault? So therefore, it's unsafe. And the the point of um, uh, all these cases is that a small subset of the language is the part that is considered unsafe. And most of the code you write in the language is safe and checked by the type checker and has strong guarantees. And so the, the sort of idea behind Rust on safe blocks and also Haskell FFI and all these other situations is that if you write the unsafe code correctly, then you maintain the type safety guarantees. So the unsafe code can be thought of as some sort of trusted computing base where you only have to go look at that code. You only have to review it very carefully to make sure there aren't any problems with it. And when that code is correct, then you can still keep writing tons and tons of code that is in the safe fragment of the language and you know, rest assured that there are safety guarantees in those cases. Now, whether or not this is true or not, like whether or not, like what it means to write unsafe code correctly, that can be a very difficult question to answer. And so for example, the Rust Belt project, um, which is by one of my uh, former co-advisors um, when I was in grad school, um, this is all about sort of like looking very carefully at the semantics of Rust and answering the question, what does it mean to write correct unsafe code? Because it can in fact be very difficult to answer that question in a precise way. Thanks. These are great questions. I love the questions. Um, I hope Twitch is there. I haven't, I haven't heard any questions from Twitch so far, uh, but uh, I'm happy to answer questions from y'all as well. Uh, some people would say that um, this pyramid is, uh, should be set up differently and statically type languages are um, superior to dynamically typed languages uh, when we're talking at the very top of the pyramid. Uh, okay, 
Sure, maybe. I, I have less of a bone in this fight these days because I write Python all day. Um, I used to write Haskell all day, and now I write Python all day. And I don't know. It's, it's, it just depends on the situation, in my opinion. Okay, so that's, that's sort of all of the, like, um, you know, fuzzy-wuzzy philosophical stuff about type systems in general. And um, love to hear the questions. If there are any more questions, um, I'd be happy to tell you, you more about it. So the next part of this lecture, and I'm probably not going to finish it today, so we will spill over into tomorrow's lecture, is I'm now going to tell you how type for inference in Haskell actually works. And um, the algorithm that I'm going to tell you about is what we call Hindley-Milner type inference. Um, it's, uh, it's, a really, it's a really elegant algorithm, and you'll see hopefully why it's so elegant when you have to implement it yourself. But it, it's, 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 um, it's doing this tightrope balance uh, where um, it's trying to write a program. Sorry, what do I want to say? So the tightrope balance that Henley Milner type inference uh, uh, is um, sort of navigating is this inference question that um, I have in uh, in here. And in particular, um, when I'm talking about Henley Miller type inference, what this means is that I can write programs and I can um, put zero types on them. I can do literally no types in my program. And Henley Miller type inference is guaranteed to find um, the type for your program. And not only is it guaranteed to find the type, but there's a sense in which it is guaranteed to find the best type that you could have written for your program in question. And this is actually pretty hard to do because um, when you start adding tons of like fancy new features to your type system, you tend to lose all of the nice properties that Henley Milner has. So, well, we're gonna talk about Henley Milner because it's cool and because it's very elegant and because it's a really useful starting point to understand how real world type systems work. So let's talk a little bit about type inference. So um, I said type inference allows you to not have to write types for any of your programs. And so um, this is something that is kind of um, probably a bit uh, difficult to, um, uh, to realize in many languages because in most programming languages, for example, when you write a function, um, you are obligated to write down what the type of the function is. So here I have some code in C, and uh, when I write a function in C, C is statically typed, even though it's not, it's unsafe, but C is statically typed. And um, to write this function, I have to say, well, the argument to this function is an integer, and the output type of this function is an integer. And that's um, going to sort of drive how type checking works here. In Haskell, I don't have to do that. If I'm writing a function that takes in one argument and I want to add one to it, I can just say fx equals x plus one and Haskell will automatically figure out, it will automatically infer what the types of all the variables and of the functions are in my program. So that's pretty cool and um, it's pretty nice uh, when you're like writing Haskell code very quickly because um, it's very easy to like whip out a quick function on the go and uh, uh, you know, not you, you know what's in your head. And um, you know, one of the like uh, oft touted uh, benefits of dynamically typed languages is you can just prototype really fast. You don't have to spend all the time uh, like thinking about um, uh, what types you don't want to write down for your functions. And then later, maybe you, you know, when you're stabilizing your program, you write down the types. But in Haskell, you can do that too, as long as you write well-typed code. Um, you, you don't have to write down any of the types. Haskell can figure them out for you. So we're going to talk about how to do type inference. But as I said, um, GHC Haskell is very big and a very complicated language. And in fact, it doesn't actually use Hindley Milner type inference um, to actually do its type checking. It uses something kind of similar, but not actually that similar. There, there's like a very, very long academic paper it's describing how uh, GHC's type 
inference algorithm works. And also it doesn't even, it's not even up to date because they keep adding new extensions, uh, you know, uh, every like <laughs> every popple. Um, there's a, another paper about something wacky they added to Haskell's type system. So to sort of keep a tamp on the complexity, we're going to talk about uh, uh, mu Haskell, uh, a, a Haskell subset that contains a lot of the features we know and love from Haskell, but not any of the like really fancy features. Um, so here is a, like, a quick definition of the language. Um, there's a bunch of stuff, but um, uh, the most important part of this are the expressions. So um, mu Haskell programs only support a limited set of expressions. So we'll support lists, we'll support Booleans, we'll support pairs, the tuples, and we'll support integers. And we're not going to support anything else. We're not going to support arbitrary algebraic data types. Um, but like, you know, if you squint, you can kind of see how those would work um, once you look at the rules here. And so, uh, so the expressions say all the ways we can create uh, values of these various types. And I've also added some language constructs like uh, function application and um, you know, if then else. And we also uh, have the set of valid types for these programs. So you know, once again, uh, what is a type? A type is either bool, int, a pair of two types, uh, a list type, where the type says what the elements of the list are, or a function type from type to type. And um, we'll also have um, a way of doing pattern matching and uh, writing top level declarations. So, so this is a pretty, pretty beefy, um, beefy subset of Haskell that we're gonna be looking at. Um, the way that I am going to present how Hindley Milner type inference works is uh, I am going to uh, go through a series of examples and explain how um, you know the inference algorithm works in those examples. And then once we are done uh, in the next lecture, I am going to then uh, give, dip us into a little bit of the sort of formal systems that you might see in programming languages papers that describe how type system works. But we're going to we're, we're just going to go through these five examples. Uh, by the way, um, the important example, like if you want to fall asleep and then uh, tune back in, the really, really important example is example two, um, where we uh, look at how polymorphism gets handled in Henley and Muller type inference. All right, so let's get started. So uh, we're going to use exactly that same function that I gave in the intro. Uh, and so this is going to be a function uh, which takes one argument, adds two to it, and returns f. And so think for a moment what you think the type of this function is going to be. Don't ask Haskell because Haskell is going to give you a very generalized type. Uh, remember, we're in mu Haskell. There's no such thing as type classes in Haskell. We only have integers. So this plus is, is a function on integers. Uh, there's a question. Still on it. Oops, that's my phone. Never mind. Uh, so. So uh, hopefully um, running your internal type checker in your head, um, you have worked out that this function has a type from integers to integers. And maybe the way you reasoned it out was you said, well, you know, I remembered the explicit type annotations from the earlier slide, and that's how I knew it was integers to integers. Or maybe you did something like, well, you know, uh, it's gonna be some function, it takes an argument, it's gonna return something. Uh, and well, I see that I'm adding two to the um, to x. So like, if I'm going to add something to x, that means x had to be an integer. And what's the result of adding things? Well, that's also an integer. And that's a um, good uh, that's a good start. Um, there's a question here, which is, are we able to make assumptions about plus? And sorry, let me let me just recap this. So in mu Haskell, um, we'll support arithmetic operations, and those arithmetic operations are guaranteed to be integer to integer uh, to integer ops. So so th that's just going to be their type in those in those cases. Okay, so let's get started with this example. So the very first thing that I need to do when I have this program is I need to parse it. So um, uh, I've written out the abstract syntax tree um, for this. Um, there's some new notation. So let's just step through the syntax tree to see uh, what's in here. So at the very top, um, 
I have uh, uh, the definition of my function in question. So fun, the fun node basically says, hey, this is a, um, this is a function definition. Um, the function that I'm defining is named f, and uh, the uh, variable that I'm defining uh, is named x. And then the rightmost, uh, the rightmost uh, uh, arrow here is pointing to the actual body of the function in question. So inside the body of the function in question, um, sorry about these slides. Uh, when I when I render them on Linux, they uh, lo they look better. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, the right hand side is the body of our function two plus x. This is going to bother me. Give me a sec. I'm just going to switch to the VM. <laughs> So let's stick this in. Slideshow mode. Much better. XDG open, that's a good one. I think X open also works as well. <laughs> open is a as an OSXism. Okay. So, so we, we've got the body of the function and that's what this subtree represents. So let's, let's dig a little uh, more in detail about the various things in the subtree. So uh, first we have this variable. So the, we, we have a reference X, which refers to the X that was bound in the function in question. So I'm going to represent variable references with these d dash lines. Um, just think to the Lambda Calculus lecture, these dash lines simply say where any given variable is bound. So in this particular case, X is bound by the X inside of the function, the top level function definition here. Then um, I have these at symbol nodes. So these at symbol nodes represent a function application. And um, if we think about what's going on when I say two plus X, um, what is really going on is that I'm actually uh, uh, doing two function applications. Because remember, all functions in Haskell are curried. When I say int to int to int, I'm, actually, I'm not saying this is a two argument function that returns int. I'm actually saying this is a function that takes in an int and produces a function that takes in an int and produces an int. So um, on the right hand side, I've uh, shown how, uh, uh, oops, I've shown how two plus X is equivalent to running plus with two arguments to an X. And then I can reassociate these to see, well, first I'm applying plus with two. So that's what the first, um, that's what the first node here says. And then I'm once again applying uh, uh, that resulting function, the plus two function to X. And that's the second app node here. Questions about the syntax so far. Okay. So for the next step, uh, so I, I've got this parse tree. And for the next step, I'm going to assign type variables to all of the nodes on the tree. So I just went ahead and marched through the nodes one by one, uh, giving them distinct type variables. I did um, uh, skip uh, assigning a new type variable for x because x refers to um, this uh, x that is defined here. x can only have one type. So I just reused t1 here when I have a, had a variable binding. So how do I read these types in question? Well, uh, because I put a t0 uh, with my f, um, in other words, what I'm saying is f has the type t0. And similarly, when I put a t6 on this at node um, that roots the body of the function in question, I'm saying the expression that says plus 2x has type t6. And so that's what all these types mean. So what we're going to do with these type variables is, um, we are going to use them to basically specify a number of constraints. So what do I mean by constraints? So what, what I mean by constraints is that, um, remember when we looked at our program and we thought to ourselves, well, I'm adding X to something. And because I'm adding X to something, I must, um, X must be an integer. Um, that because of then represents some sort of constraint where when I write the abstract syntax tree in my program, 
um, the various constructs in my syntax tree result in constraints on what the types of my program can be. And those constraints are going to basically tell us what the type of our program should be in the very end. So let's go ahead and start adding some constraints in this program. And we'll, we're just going to like walk over every node in our program and add constraints in this way. So starting off, let's look at the very top of this program. So um, I have my top level function definition, and I've said f of x equals 2 plus x, um, where uh, f, x, and 2 plus x are distinct nodes. So you know they have types t0, t1, and t6. So there's some relationship between these types. Can anyone tell me what this relation should be in chat, maybe? Yeah, I'm going to wait because um, I'm just going to do this example and then I'm finishing this lecture. So, so I'm more than happy to wait. What should the constraints on T0, T1, and T6 be um, here? And as a reminder, uh, oh, what am I saying? I'm saying, you know, like f is a function. And when you give x as an argument to this function, uh, I'm going to give you 2 plus x, right? That's what the meaning of uh, one of these equations in Haskell is. They should be the same. Um, what, what's they in this situation? Okay, so someone suggests that T0 and T6 should be the same. Uh, I'm gonna just type that in the chat. Uh, so, so let's see. So, um, so then uh, you're saying to me that F, F without anything, no arguments, uh, it will have the same type as two plus X. Does that sound right? Okay, hint, that's not right. What's wrong about that? Remember, f has type t0, and t6, and uh, 2 plus x has type t6. Uh, I, someone says in chat, uh, t6 is the type after the application. Yes, I agree with that. Okay, so someone has written t0 equals t1 to t6. Um, this is correct, and let's break down why it's correct. So uh, we, have, um, we have this function, right? So the function will have type t6 after we apply it to something. So f, so t0 should be some sort of arrow type. It should be something that takes in an argument and then produces some, uh, some result. And we said t6 is the type of the application. So t6 should be the result type of the function in question. What am I passing in as the argument? Well, luckily enough for us, we said, well, x is the argument to f. So x's type is t1, and therefore the type of this overall should be t1 to t6. So this is a constraint. The constraint that I have here is that the type of f, t0, should be a function type from t1 to t6, where t1 is the type of x and t6 is the type of the body of the function. Hopefully this kind of makes sense. Um, like, you know, maybe you wouldn't be able to reproduce it, but now that you see it, uh, hopefully, you know, you're nodding your heads and saying, yeah, you know, that's kind of what I expected in this case. So let's look at another example. So here we have an apply node. And um, in the apply node, once again, there's three types involved. There's a T4, which represents the type of the entire expression, uh, 2 plus, uh, plus 2, essentially. There's a type uh, T2, which represents the type of plus, and there's the type T3 that represents the type of the uh, uh, argument to the function in question. So once again, we've got a function involved here. Um, one of these nodes is a function. The function is the plus node, right? That makes sense. Plus is a function. We're going to put some arguments onto it. So T2 equals some arrow type. What does plus take as an argument? Well, just looking at the code here, the abstract syntax tree, two is the argument to the function. So two's type, T3, is on the left-hand side of the arrow. It's the input argument type for the function. And what's the result of the function? Well, the result of the function is, you know, whatever I get after having applied uh, uh, two to plus. 
So it is the type of the overall um, entire subtree T4 in this case. So now once again, I write down the constraint T2 equals T3 arrow T4. Um, fortunately for us, uh, we can do the same thing again. So we have another apply node here, uh, T6. And uh, um, once again, T4 is the function. It's the partially applied plus that resulted from adding plus and two. So T4 is a function that takes in an X, T1 as argument, and produces T6, the entire result type. And finally, um, and this is related to that question, can we make assumptions about plus? We'll just say plus uh, ha always has type int to int to int. So T2 equals int to int to int. So just walking through every node in the asterisk index tree, I now have all of the types uh, and I have constraints between these types based on the various nodes in the syntax tree. Oh, one more thing. Uh, two is hanging out there. Um, what's the type of an integer literal? Well, we'll just say it's an integer. So T3 is an int. All right. So now we have all of these constraints. And what we need to do is we need to solve these constraints. Um, think back to your algebra class, right? You have a bunch of equations, you have a bunch of variables, and now we want to solve for these equations to figure out what the actual values of these variables are. Um, so uh, we, we, want, we don't want to say, well, f is t0 and that's t1 to t6. So that doesn't mean anything to anyone. We want to get into int in the end. So um, I'm not going to get through all of this, but we'll just pick it up uh, when I run out of time. So let's get started. So to process a constraint, we're going to go through the constraints one by one, and we're going to go ahead and um, uh, substitute all occurrences of the variable that's on the left-hand side of the constraint with the right-hand side of the constraint in question. Right? In the same way, if I have x equals uh, y plus 2 uh, in a bunch of algebraic equations, I can substitute x everywhere, eliminating x from my equations and getting me closer to a solution which has as few variables as possible. Now, in this particular case, T0 is very boring. Uh, there are no occurrences of T0, so we don't do anything uh, with it. And so now we just remember that uh, we've processed T0. There's only one occurrence of T0, so it's finished. We don't need to deal with it later. So now let's look at the next constraint, T2 equals T3 to T4, and we see, hey, uh, we actually do have a um, we actually do have a constraint here, and it is um, uh, it is a, the t two over here. So I'm going to go ahead and do the substitution, uh, giving me t three to t four equals int to int to int. And now t two is done. There's only one occurrence of t two in this slide. We'll do it again for t four. This time there are two occurrences, uh, one here and one above and one below. Go ahead and do that substitution. Um, I've inserted parentheses just for clarity. And now there's only one occurrence of T4. And now uh, we've gotten to the point where we no longer have an obvious substitution to do. Well, okay, we could do the substitution for T3, but um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do uh, the constraints in order. So I've got this constraint, which is T3 to T1 to T6 is int to int to int. And now intuitively, you're probably screaming, hey, um, like clearly t3 equals int, t1 equals int, and t6 equals int. But how is an algorithm supposed to get there? Well, um, what we're going to do is called unification. And it is now 609, so I am going to tell you all about unification on Monday. Uh, any questions in the last minute we have left? All right, thanks everyone for coming and we'll pick this up again on Monday.